Welcome, my name is Marisa Rodriguez and I'm the NAJGA manager. NAJGA, or the North American Japanese Garden Association, is an organization that's dedicated to connecting and supporting the Japanese garden community. Thanks to support provided by the Japan Foundation, this series, inspired by Dr. Kendall Brown's book, Quiet Beauty, will focus on the history and development of Japanese gardens in the U.S. Today, we'll learn about the history and development of the Portland Japanese Garden and continue our exploration of creative adaptations of the Japanese garden form in North American environments. Now I'd like to introduce our presenter, Sadafumi Uchiyama, and Professor Kendall Brown, who will participate in today's presentation. I know both Sada and Ken are very well known to many of you, but I'd like to formally introduce them for anyone who's new to the Japanese garden world in Najka. Sada Fumi Uchiyama is the chief curator and director of the International Japanese Garden Training Center at Portland Japanese Garden. He is a third generation Japanese gardener from Southern Japan, where his family has been involved in gardening for over a century. He has been involved with NAJGA since 2009 and is currently a board member. Sava has taught landscape design courses and lectured on Japanese gardening at colleges and other public gardens. He is actively engaged in public education and regularly speaks at horticultural societies, garden clubs, and schools and professional conferences in Japan and throughout the US. Sada is a registered landscape architect in Oregon and California with a BLA and an MLA from the University of Illinois. The traditional apprenticeship in Japanese gardening combined with formal training in Western landscape architecture allows him to design and build a unique and wide range of public and private landscape projects. His representative projects include the renovation of the Osaka Garden, the site of the 1893 Great Columbian Exposition at Jackson Park in Chicago, Shofuen at Denver Botanic Gardens, and most recently he completed Shounke, Japanese Garden at Sarah Duke Gardens at Duke University, North Carolina. He is working on the Rolex headquarters in Dallas, Texas, in collaboration with Gengo Kuma. Dr. Kendall Brown is Professor of Asian Art History at California State University, Long Beach. He publishes actively in several areas of Japanese art, as well as on Japanese style gardens in North America. He has also curated exhibitions for several American museums, exploring topics from modern woodblock prints and art deco to lacquer makers tools. He was also a co-founder and past president of Najka and served on our board from 2012 to 2017. Welcome Sada and Ken. As we've heard in the last seven weeks, uh, we've heard great stories, and I've just been sitting here enjoying them, usually uh, drinking a beer and uh, eating some snacks, just hearing these wonderful histories of, of Japanese gardens across North America. Uh, and one of the themes that's come out is gardens are planned and they're built, and they grow in some ways planned and unplanned, and then so often they're revised. Uh, and we've heard, as Marisa said, that Sada Uchiyama has already appeared three times in Bob Carr's discussion a month ago uh, of the Garden of the Phoenix, uh, used to be the Osaka Sister City Garden in Chicago, where Sada was part of one uh, an ongoing renovation plan. Uh, last week, we heard about uh, the work that he's done both at Cheekwood and uh, some greater accessibility at Blood Arrow Reserve. And so this gets to a really fundamental point that Japanese gardens or gardens in general, uh, but Japanese gardens in particular, unlike virtually every other work of art, is a work in progress, always changing. And, and in some ways, it's really out of step with the kind of Western idea of the work of art that's finished and is associated with one maker, you know, the artist, the architect, the designer, or even the Western concept of the master plan, which of course you need uh, in most cities um, to submit to, to get your approval. Um, so today in his discussion, which uh, we're going to have a little bit of a kind of uh, talk, Sada and I, normally we, we meet about once a year. I think Sada was in Los Angeles just a, uh, a year ago, right before the pandemic uh, uh, shut down. Uh, we had lunch together. He had just flown in from the East Coast where he was working on a private garden, was coming to LA for a symposium at the Huntington. So 
it's wonderful to be with Sada today, even in, in Zoom. Um, but we're going to talk about, and he's going to present, and I'll ask some, some questions as it uh, seems appropriate, on, on the Portland Japanese Garden. It's certainly one of the most famous, if not the most famous Japanese garden in North America, uh, one of the best visited, um, best models for how gardens evolve, and, and this is, is no accident and that there's really a, a multiplicity of plans and planners and garden makers. At the Nazca conference in Portland two years ago, uh, our keynote speakers, professors Amasaki and Kato of uh, Kyoto University of Art and Design, spoke about hard creation, the sort of first plan, and then the soft creation of what the gardeners do month after month, year after year. And so very much following up on that, um, I think this presentation this week uh, by Sada on the Portland Garden will take us through that, that history at Portland, which is the history of a garden as it's evolved by garden curators, of which Sada is the most recent in a long and illustrious history. Thank you, Ken and Marisa for the uh, introduction. This is a, a rare uh, opportunity for me to uh, talk exclusively um, about the history of Portland Japanese Garden. So usually I have a fancy, beautiful winter, summer, fall pictures of the garden, but the, uh, I have very few of them today. But instead, um, I just go through uh, literally the 70 years of uh, history uh, here in Portland. So um, just I start off of this the Portland Japanese Garden, like many other um, uh, Japanese gardens throughout the United States, is uh, um, actually uh, built out of the sort of um, the World War II um, um, resorts and then people's willing uh, to build uh, uh, the friendship uh, in, in a new way. And the Japanese Garden <clears throat> has been always the um, part of this uh, friendship building. So Portland Japanese Garden is no exception, started uh, right on 1963. That's an actual official um, start of the garden history. Now you mentioned Sada, if I can just jump in there, that you know it's coming out of the sister cities, which was our, our theme a couple of weeks ago. But you know, if you most of I think of us have been to the garden, and if you haven't, you, you need to go. It seems so natural. It's just amazing, as your slide here shows that in fact, the site of what is in, uh, the Portland Japanese Garden now was originally the zoo. So uh, how does Takuma Paul Tono, trained at Cornell, then long working at uh, Tokyo University of Agriculture, what is his original kind of master plan for this space? Yes, um, I believe he somehow instinctively knew uh, the Japanese Garden can play an important role in this sort of cultural or, you know, diplomacy or you know, basically education, um, mutual education of, uh, uh, of own culture. So um, <clears throat> what he came up with was uh, um, sort of showcasing the various types of Japanese garden. It's really purely, uh, he know this is actually the tool for ed education. And even though, um, you know, we're uh, close before and after the war, uh, still um, the, this little country in the East is uh, uh, less known. So he thought the, the garden is uh, um, the beautiful and wonderful tools uh, to basically educate and the sort of um, by way of enjoying the beauty of Japanese garden. So I think he is, uh, um, there is some writings and he was very uh, clear about uh, what garden serves as sort of with the culture of diplomacy. So education, um, of course he himself is an educator. So he was very much mindful about uh, uh, the sort of where the garden can be placed and function. And I guess you, he's also fluent in English. I've read some of his letters to, to the to Portland. And so I think maybe unlike other garden designers coming from Japan, we talked about uh, uh, Juki Ida a couple of weeks ago, that with his training in Cornell back in the 20s, his master's in landscape architecture, he probably more than most has a kind of, he's attuned to what, what Americans want to know or need to know about Japanese gardens. Yes, so um, 
Yeah. You know, basically, we, 1920, that's a way back. Um, so the Professor Tono is actually known as the first Japanese landscape architect, more than being the Japanese gardeners, actually, in Japan. So um, definitely, he was the first uh, officially trained uh, landscape architect. And actually, he practiced uh, in Tokyo for a long, long time and educated many, many uh, students uh, throughout his career. So um, given his education and the background um, in landscape architecture at the Cornell, and during the, his, his school years, and he also traveled and actually designed and quite extensively. Uh, so I think he was very aware of the, um, the place of the Japanese garden in the context of the Western and the U.S. culture. So um, this is a, not the today's topic, but uh, in my view, actually, Portland Japanese garden overall uh, design layout is actually Western, not the Japanese. The components are purely Japanese, though. So that kind of makes Portland very uh, interesting and unique. So here's the 1963, and actually picture is a lot of orders, and uh, used to be um, the uh, Oregon Zoo uh, that in Washington Park in Portland. That's where the um, we have still the part of this concrete uh, right, right at our big waterfall. <laughs> so, and uh, in the construction, the Professor Tono incorporated some of the um, concrete structures uh, to build our lower pond and the waterfall. So here, Kent is a, a master plan. It's interesting, just uh, I'd like to point it out a few things. So the uh, master plan to the left is 1963 version. That, this is uh, what the Professor Tono um, actually prepared uh, at, his, uh, at his office. And then on the, on the right side is 1964, just a year. So there was a uh, quite, few of uh, back and forth between Professor Tono and then the uh, Parks and Recreation of City of Portland. That was the original sort of owner of this garden. Later on, the garden was basically uh, becoming a non-profit organization right now, uh, late 1960. But the beginning was very under the Parks and Recreation the cities. So the city had assigned a landscape architect uh, to work with the Professor Tono. So after a few uh, um, different versions, and then pretty much this 1964 uh, plan is the closest to the current, um, what it's, we call Portland Japanese garden. So if you look at the red arrows to the left, so that were uh, those who know the Portland Japanese garden or have visited it, um, probably can notice a teak, house tea garden was located way up and as opposed to you can see the 1964 version is way down they move uh, quite um, different location this is something to do with uh, instability of the land and they found where original location was unstable and then also the uh, it was too sunny it was right there was no vegetation whatsoever and then they brought to the uh, sort of southern end, which means basically the uh, no spacing and shady and nice moist kind of more like a tea garden. So that was a big move. And another thing is a sand and stone garden, Karesansui. You can see on, on the left, yellow arrow, almost right in the, the middle um, of the garden. And then that was moved where the tea garden or tea house was originally located. So uh, it's interesting enough that the part of the uh, main reason was the uh, instability of the ground and they built a wall and the sand and stone garden and you will see later, yes, it's, it, there is a crack. So land is still moving. <laughs> so original uh, uh, assessment was correct, but uh, uh, I'm glad but it's not the tea house. If it's a tea house, that would be a big deal. So, so again, it's uh, our original uh, design was prepared to the left, 1963. Then 64 was this much change. One last thing, this yellow uh, green circle. This came in 1964. They, there was a proposal for the tramway actually going down. As you know, this is on top of the hill. 
So there is a now what we call zigzag path going back and forth. But the, there was a proposal for the tramway <laughs> originally in 1964. But the, uh, thanks to the opposition or you know the, the board members, um, this never uh, be realized. So, but the, there was a tram, dream tramway actually proposed back then. You know, it's, it's fascinating, Sada, that you mentioned, you know, that this is really a, a new thing that, that Professor Tono has done, the kind of educational sampler garden, a little like the bento lunch, you know, you get, you get uh, one of several different styles. As we saw last week at uh, Fort Worth, that's now been adapted, you know, the sort of a, a variety, a dry garden, a tea garden, a pond stroll garden. But Professor Tono did another thing, as your slide shows, you know, uh, that, that has not been adopted, which is really to set up this system or to initiate the garden director system. So that master plan, which was never quite finished in construction when, when he left, he knew was going to be evolved step by step by future generations. Can you tell us a little more about how that director system was born and how it's evolved? I think it, the, um, this building the garden over a long period of time is somehow is, I think he uh, actually took the sort of how the traditionally the garden was built in Japan. None of those old gardens never built in the one year or you know, such a short time. Over several um, generations and you know 10 20 years is a common thing so i think he has a uh, very uh, clear ideas uh, this and of course he knew that the funding was favorable necessary so um he had a, a long term vision i'm sure but the, interesting enough there was no mention of this uh, bringing the japanese gardener uh, consecutively and continuously I think this was more to do with uh, one, I'm sure Professor Tono um, recommended, you know, someone from Japan has to come and oversee the construction. That's one. And he was very clear in his actually correspondence with the city. And the two and the board uh, members probably back then was uh, one of the strongest uh, group of people, very influential, very visionary. So they really took on the Professor Tono's recommendation and then um, they are okay to just uh, stick to the original plan of basically just the long term and bring in the professionals from Japan. So now um, after you know, uh, 30, 40 years, finally so we actually recognize this is actually the system very clearly. You can see from first generation Kia Hira is 1964, and then all the way to the eighth uh, generation, uh, Tanaka san, Toru Tanaka, up until 1990. So, technically speaking, Japanese garden in Portland didn't complete until 1990. So, that's an interesting thing, Stan. If, if you take the pictures in the, each, you know, decades, 1970, 1980, 1980. 90, you see the different uh, kind of uh, sort of degree of um, completion. Um, so finally, 1990 is really the, um, the closest to what we have uh, today. So it took uh, eight generations of uh, Japanese uh, gardeners, and I'll be the ninth one, uh, basically. But the please note, um, there was a this no garden director period, just about uh, uh, 15, over 15 years, actually. So last one was uh, Tanaka-san, it's ended 1990, and he stayed uh, a few years, 1992, but uh, after that, until I came on board, 2008. So they're about uh, 17, 18 years. So the, my biggest challenge was we really, uh, basically taking this uh, last time of uh, 15 years um, of course, there was a the, um, the group of gardeners uh, headed by the you know the chief uh, gardener um, for 15 years, um, but the, more or less uh, the garden was uh, directed in terms of the maintenance by a committee of board members, and until I came on board 2008. So here are the eight directors. I'm sure uh, some of you know some of them very well. <laughs> These are 
some are very uh, well known. And of, here is a uh, Professor Tono. Professor Tono actually involved from again 1963, but the actual construction is uh, he was involved probably just very only three years, no more than that. And he was not the um, the residence in Portland. He came basically his he was a faculty at the Tokyo Agricultural University and other universities. So he can afford only two months at a time each year. And basically during the summer he came and then directed and worked with the garden director of the time. Primarily the first generation here here. Hirasan works courses and Hirasan is actually as a uh, Professor Tonald student. He was handpicked uh, as a garden director and the first one, and he served the longest. And, but the, he served the toughest time. And this was very just 10 years from the end of the World War II. So you can imagine the sentiment um, around important areas. You know, the, basically someone from the uh, enemy just 10 years ago um, was uh, working. And then second is uh, uh, Chris-san, Hoich Chris is the second garden director, third Hachiro Sakakiba, and then Michi, Michio Akui, and then I'm sure some of you know uh, Masa-san, Masayuki Mizuno, then Kichiro Sano, then Takao Donoma, then the last one is Toru Tanaka. So just a couple of things here is uh, actually Chris San and Masa San and Tanaka San actually uh, decided to stay in Portland. So they are practicing in, in basically Portland base. So that's uh, one, uh, I think, occasion we, when we get together back in the, uh, I think, the director's reunion. We're talking about, uh, um, you know, just uh, including myself, it's four of us live in Portland, and this is really the direct resort of Portland Japanese Garden. We um, planted the big seeds uh, in Portland, and four of us combined, probably we can actually name the quite few of the Japanese gardens throughout the United States, but the uh, four of us all in Portland. So there's a green arrow. And one, two, three, Chris san, Sakaki san, Wakui san, Donuma san, Tanaka san. I will get back to these five individual. Five individual, these uh, folks have a special uh, connection uh, uh, to each other. And so I will address later on. Um, interesting enough is, uh, um, of course, each each garden director, that was a different stage of construction. And that the one common garden that everyone touched is a tea garden. So that's interesting. So someone just did the flat garden only, but did a little bit of tea garden. The next, next person did the uh, uh, sand and stone garden and the tea garden. So it's interesting enough, the tea garden is really, uh, as you all know, well, it's really a sort of symbolic um, position within the Japanese garden style. There's a, a, all different styles, but the tea garden has a special place. And of course, tea garden has a, a many details and uh, um, knowledge-based sort of practice um, need to be learned. And so each gardener obviously has own sort of understanding of uh, the tea garden. So therefore they have to sort of uh, practice on this part of the garden. So everyone touched actually, and only one didn't really touch yet. <laughs> so I might. So, <laughs> so uh, let's start upper right. This is actually how tea garden, this is today's tea garden, bottom left. You can see the, how big it is. And the tea garden was started almost like a one close to one third of, of the today's, basically this portion. So upper right is original design. It's very different. And also orientation of tea house is different. And then this is, I believe, third generation and design. And then you can see the expansion actually took place quite substantially. So I believe uh, fourth, fifth, seventh generation garden director spend a lot of time 
on T garden. Then eventually, uh, this is the closest, um, is 1984 version. So that's almost uh, what we have today, except a few other additions. So um, again, it's interesting that everyone wants to leave the sort of their own sort of little mark on and especially on the key guide. Odu Tanaka told me that uh, he had to replace some of the stepping stones because <laughs> uh, yeah. they were a little wet and slippery. So even though he didn't do much of the redesign, he did at least uh, do some of the stones. Right. Well, actually, Toru-san, Tanaka-san added the well, stone well, right here. There's nothing in 1984 version. As th this is before he comes on board. So he added to that. And of course, the aesthetic stone is another thing. Uh, but the, the, this is important things. And I'll, I'll add this later. Again, it's a, the, the, the maintenance is a really an incremental improvement. Um, so maintenance, we tend to think the plunings and the sweeping the ground and all those things. But the actual maintenance is a, a small improvement, continuous improvement. That's the very important part of the improvement. So uh, throughout the history, Portland Japanese Garden had a, you know, this eight garden director full time, and they really continuously improved. So even it's a very humble start. Um, you will see some uh, slides after uh, uh, this comment. Um, you will feel good about it because even Portland Japanese Garden started from here. <laughs> Those are the pictures I will show you. So here is uh, what used to be called Ghost Hill. And this is where now the actually pavilion stands and commanding the beautiful view of downtown Portland and Mount Hood beyond. You can see this. Uh, but the uh, selection of the sites, uh, Professor Tono actually had a few um, options. And the uh, Oregon Zoo site was one of them. And he was very specific about uh, on this uh, location to choose. And uh, yet, traditionally, in, 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 in a way, the uh, Japanese gardens are more like in the valley than on top of the hill. So again, and this, this selection itself really tells uh, who T Professor Tono is and where his thinking was. And he was very much um, mindful about uh, this Japanese garden being a public. That means a lot, actually. Someone who could see the Japanese garden as a public space and serving the large uh, number of people. That itself is very, uh, very much, I think, uh, advanced thinking back then. So it used to be Ghost Hill. And then uh, here is a. Uh, 2004 pictures, I believe, flat garden, and used to be like that. This would be, I believe, this were the bird cage or some aviary <laughs> was in this location. Um, this little building actually, the restroom actually lasted quite a long time until I believe uh, close to the 1980 something. So uh, this was the only building left after the zoo was moved to the, another location. And then here is the first generation uh, West Leaf Japanese garden. And this doesn't exist anymore, but uh, uh, obviously Professor Tono uh, staked uh, the, you know, the garden on the ground. And some years later, this is uh, what we have right now. And this is the one rare picture of the uh, during the first uh, garden director here upper left, you can see this is Hira-san, Hinya Hira, doing some pruning. Only connection you can see is uh, this Nuresa Girantan still exists today. And obviously back then the off-leash dog was okay. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, it's uh, Hira-san walking in the garden where it's dark. So this is almost identical, actually, orientation, same view of the garden back then, you know, about 60 some years ago and today. And uh, 
Kayushki Strong Pond Garden. Again, uh, this is uh, again a con construction. I believe both of them right around 1970, early 70. Um, here is actually tea house stands today, right here. And here is a bridge. And back then, winter was cold and upper pond was ice. So you can see this was very suspicious that there was someone at the <laughs> Garden director of the reunion, someone said, This must be Sakaki Bara san. <laughs> Sakaki Bara san said, No, I'm not. <laughs> so, so back then, the, uh, they enjoyed the ice hockey as well on Upper Pond. <laughs> so, so, building a pond garden, a stroll style pond garden, and a flat garden is not so unusual. But I think the, the next thing that, that Professor Tono designs. Is, is the dry garden, which was pretty controversial, as we know, you know, built and then taken out and returned. And, you know, right at the time, early 60s, he's designing the Portland garden. He's also hired by the Brooklyn Botanic Garden mm -hmm. to create a dry garden there. And his original designs are very avant-garde. And then George Avery, the director of the Brooklyn Botanic Garden says, well, you know, these avant-garde designs are, maybe they'll work, maybe they won't, but that, Duanji Stone Garden is a classic. So Tono is sort of forced to do a replica of Duanji at Brooklyn. But how do you think that impacts, you know, his his uh, very bold and avant-garde dry garden in Portland? Yeah, I think, it, um, well, actually, uh, I haven't seen any sort of uh, mentioning by Professor Tono about uh, the book. Wing. So, um, he, he may not be uh, so thrilled about uh, just simply making a copy of the, uh, this 500 years old garden. So definitely when he came to Portland, he had very clear ideas, at least I believe, of the, the Kalesansi portion. Was, uh, um, this is uh, the, by far the most uh, time and energy and thinking he spent uh, during his, his uh, actually the, um, the time in Portland. So upper right here is the Professor Tono standing next to this the vertical. This is the Columbia Basalt. And the record shows he brought 15 of these lookalike and then basically picked one, this one. I saw two more lookalike and still exist within the garden, but uh, I haven't seen the list of the 12 or 13. Uh, rocks he brought in. And then, um, so he, he himself placed this stone with the help of here is uh, Kenya Hira after the construction was uh, taking a picture with, uh, I believe this must be our, um, one of the donors. Right. So this is the oldest um, actually uh, prints I could find of the uh, sand and stone garden. Um, so one vertical tall uh, stone with the seven little curves. So um, the garden went through many changes and good and bad. Um, however, what's important is without losing its vision and, and its journey continues uh, today. So um, this is something I'll um, address later, but the how to um, maintain the vision and of course the mission, those two. Um, it's a very abstract, so it's hard to um, sort of, it, this is not something you can hand to the next person, um, but you have to share and then just confirm the vision is actually shared. So one of the change and the big change, and in, in some way it's a, a sad story, but the other way it's a great learning. And keep in mind, the garden can change overnight, easily. Um, all you need is just a few guys to help you and one crane or a little equipment, then done. So, um, so Philip's side of maintaining the vision is the basically uh, this uh, continuous sort of building or changing the garden. The garden is in, in such a vulnerable position. If there is a well, um, the garden certainly will change. So these are the uh, probably uh, some of uh, you haven't seen this uh, today is bottom right. But at least the three distinct generation of the um, 
sandstone garden a potent Japanese garden change this much um, over this one is over uh, 20 some years. So um, again, the, the change and can have the, you know, lasting long um, impact. Yeah, that's a, as you mentioned, Sada, you know, that original design is so much like a work of art. It, it can't really evolve. But based on that master plan that you showed us uh, at, towards the beginning, um, that it seems that much of the garden ha had not been built or kind of thoroughly designed or planted so that as these uh, seven different curators over the uh, first, you know, between 1965 and, and 1990, how, how does this idea of, of kind of soft creation, of, of revising, how does this actually play out in parts of the garden that we see today? Well, I think, uh, um, <clears throat> Keep in mind, you know, the, um, this eight directors, um, they're, they're very close um, range in terms of their ages. So when, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Hira-san, uh, first uh, garden director, he was just very, I believe, 26. Mm -hmm. So in average, most of the garden director of the time they came to Portland was somewhere, you know, 25, 26 years old and not uh, any older than 30, 32 years old. So um, definitely the Professor Tono's position back in Japan was a big influence. So master plan was a sort of God-given document they have to follow. And they are specifically actually hired and basically brought to the Portland to build the garden based on the master plan. That's one thing. So um, master plan calls for on actually five gardens, the Hiraniwa flat gardens and strawing pond garden, Kaiyushiki, Chaniwa and sand and stone garden. And one, this uh, sort of um, doesn't exist, but the Morse Garden. So there was a five, we call Proton Japanese Garden, the five garden style. And it's not the Morse Garden, now what we call natural garden. So Morse Garden, its irony is in this location, proposed and tested, but it was way too sunny and baking ground. <laughs> so they couldn't grow the moss. Ironically, that this natural garden used to be moss garden area is uh, the coldest and the wettest and the shadiest spot today. <laughs> so, so, um, so there's a master plan that was a, a very important to follow. But the second thing, uh, Ken, is uh, what um, my, I believe the reason is natural garden is actually this garden director's creation. This is not the Professor Tono's original plan. So they have uh, at least one garden to work on. And all this, uh, please remember back when first, very first slides, there was uh, five garden directors out of eight are from the same school and under uh, the same teacher, Kenzo Ogata. We call it uh, Zoki no Niwa School, natural garden style. So all those fives, and Kuri-san and Wakui-san and Donoma-san and, and those uh, folks uh, basically this from the same school. And so they came up with this uh, idea of this, uh, what we call natural garden today. It's actually, it wasn't a part of the original design, but the um, primary, I believe, between um, Sakakibara-san, third generation, and Kuri-san, the second uh, garden director, uh, they are the instrumental for this garden. So interesting enough, there was a actually shallow pond in what we call natural garden today. <laughs> it's very different experience and the sand and stone garden is up here. So now looking back from this pictures, this position, I'm sitting in a little machiai structure in the natural garden, looking back up. You can see the steps here and step here. 
that's the only indicative of the, you are in, standing in the same spot. But it used to be the very shallow. Um, of course, this is, you can see, very sunny spot. Whereas now today is a meandering shallow uh, creek. That's the, and this is again very indicative of the, this the particular style and school of the gardening in the very naturalistic arrangement of the deciduous trees. And of course, change happens at unintendedly. And this is, uh, uh, there was a winter of 1997, and there was a big ice storm. And here is the main waterfall. And there was a few Douglas fir standing. And they toppled, and basically as they toppled, their root structures actually buckled the, um, the concrete structure underneath the, uh, the waterfall. So waterfall uh, need to be uh, rebuilt. So uh, the next spring in 1998, and uh, um, back then uh, the uh, Chris and Hoichi Chris and Chris International um, was uh, uh, given the commission to rebuild uh, the waterfall while garden is open. So um, this was a project within actually Chris and did within uh, not two months actually shorter than that, probably 45 days, 50 days. It was a very intense um, period. And I came to Portland and working for the uh, Chris International in 1994. This is basically the fifth year of my uh, actually working uh, for Chris and at his office. And this project came. Well, you, you've kind of given us an example of, of this gradual evolution in editing, you know, in some ways following the master plan, but taking it step by step with each garden director's own skill set and ideas. And then, of course, the, the, the Ogata Kai, kind of the students of uh, Kenzo Ogata moving in this other direction with the natural garden. But for your own case, now you come on board um, 2008 and a new director, Steve Bloom, and a really dramatic uh, vision to expand the, the garden and the cultural crossing, the village, the moving from the bottom of the hill up where that original tramway had been. So how do you see the plan evolving, uh, this whole kind of legacy of adaptation evolving in your 13 year time as garden director? I guess in a way it's sort of like a relay race. Right, right. <laughs> These people were on a team handing the baton and then 18 years, nobody. Uh, people like Hoichi Kurisu and working, coming back on this one project. So a new era starts. Can you mm -hmm. tell us about that? I think it, it, the, the shortest answer is I am only serving this garden 10, 15 years. That's it. And the garden outlive our life and hopefully 200, 300, 400 years. Um, I am from a traditional sort of gardener's uh, family. And we know the garden does not belong to one person. And sometimes uh, the multiple generation, you know, 10, 12, 15, 20 generation of the gardener maintain the garden and gardens still uh, live on. So, in that sense, um, my guidance is not necessarily the, my instinct or what I want, but more to do with uh, what's um, the needs in front, you know, different time uh, requires a different needs. And for instance, like uh, having the only 10,000 or even 7,000 visitors back in 1970 or uh, later 1970, as opposed to the half million year 2000. <laughs> that's a totally different ball game. So that is the uh, important guidance. So I think uh, the 50% of what guiding me is really the needs of the time. And needs of the time, yet uh, not just the satisfying today's needs, but the, what that means in the future. So that's the uh, one. So I'm, in a way, uh, my decision making is very democratic in a way. And the second thing is, as, as I know, I'm not the only one. There will be uh, generations after me in this position. So something in the common is basically the what gardens actually tells us.
to do or not to do. So as a sort of um, uh, the part of the Japanese garden tradition, and I was trained in a very traditional way. You know, if someone is uh, capable and knowledgeable enough about the, what Japanese garden is about and the tradition and skills, usually we conclude in a very similar, um, we landed in a very similar spot in terms of the, uh, the judgment of whether to do or not to do. So I think again, and I'm not here forever, therefore the, I cannot make a irresponsible change. And then it's something to do with the users and the owner, which is the board and members, and something to do with the garden and garden needs and to basically cope with uh, this large uh, visitorship um, and uh, usage. Well, with that large and changing visitorship in mind, let's, let's see, we've got about 15 minutes left. Uh, what, what, what has taken place? Okay, so 2014 and actually 2013, so the, uh, uh, the garden was experiencing over 300,000, actually 350,000. So there was a big, um, outcry for the, um, the garden becoming not quiet anymore uh, because of the uh, popular idea um, and the many visitors. So we launched a big, um, what we call culture crossing, it's basically expansion pro uh, project in 2014 and actually um, the finish of the project is 2017. Basically has a, with the two goals. One is basically keep the original gardens, five gardens intact. And the second goal is basically still um, outside of the uh, old five gardens, um, being the Japanese garden outside of Japan, um, we have to still maintain the tradition, but at the same time, tradition has to evolve. So we need to test basically a new way of um, building the Japanese garden, a new way of using the Japanese garden without um, basically changing uh, anything fundamental of the, uh, what we inherited from Japan. So this, uh, some of you probably familiar, this used to look like our garden house and uh, everything, this tough shed, <laughs> these are all our offices back then. So basically this portion is the existing five gardens and all those uh, expansion and change happens outside of the garden. The again, the goal is to maintain this garden quiet. That means to prepare the facilities and space to do something noisy and undesirable um, um, to do in the old garden. So basically these two circles, these are the two main areas of improvements. So this is a nice, um, we should have saved this actually a little bus. <laughs> so they, uh, and then construction began 2015 and then the, uh, right before the rain season starts. And then um, the way we did the construction is uh, obviously buildings are Kengokuma design and uh, was uh, um, uh, contracted out to the general contractors. But the garden uh, we believe, and I believe, um, I we uh, try to uh, convince the, uh, the board members garden has to be designed built. It's not something designed on someone else to build. So basically we took a large portion, um, about 5 million out of the budget to allocate for the landscape construction. Then I play as a landscape architect as well as a general contractor basically to design and build. These are the, some of the sketches for the garden. And this is a now famous, uh, what we call castle uh, wall construction. This was done in the wettest month of January, March. It took uh, two and a half months and I, I have a record. We have only very eight days of sun and all <laughs> the rest is the rain as Portland is expected. So the large uh, transplant um, the, of the, this Japanese maple was uh, planted right before, be, behind the cafe on the sort of treehouse-like arrangement. 
And so this is uh, basically the 2017 spring uh, we all complete. And then the roof, as you can see, the, uh, the green roof. Um, so the uh, green roof, um, this is, again, this could be another topic. But uh, uh, as I said, the tradition uh, has to keep moving because tradition never be a standstill. The new try out the creative uh, ideas is actually built the ne next uh, tradition. That's how the Japanese garden history evolved. So we cannot be stand still. So in, in this case, in the, through the culture crossing, um, the biggest challenge and biggest uh, try, um, basically uh, attempt of the moving the tradition forward is we are very conscious about the connection between the traditional Japanese garden spirit and the techniques with uh, what we call green infrastructure today. And by most landscape architects um, interest today to build a basically green infrastructure to clean the water, um, all those uh, environmental sort of um, concerns uh, built in the landscape. So roof garden is a one manifestation for, for that uh, thinking. So now back to the same chart. Um, so um, I, I forgot to mention the one a very important thing. The, the, this eight uh, garden directors or an unintended tree, but uh, was a was a board uh, commitment and a Professor Donald's recommendation. It's it's become sort of system to actually uh, construct the a garden and through continuous sort of um, the vision. And what this did that uh, three tangible. Um, the positive uh, impact on the Portland Japanese garden. One is the master plan was collectively followed, not that by one individual. So it, more than one garden director was always uh, at present in some sort. So this is not something one person's interpretation of the master plan, but the collectively as an eight Japanese gardeners agree on to follow. So that's a very important part, how the vision and the master plan kept alive. And the second thing is that because over 20 some years the garden was built, the plant materials were well tested. Something doesn't good well and didn't survive and something actually grow well, actually it becomes a main part of the garden. So there was a time or the, um, the garden director was able to test the different plants, which they are not familiar with coming from Japan. They didn't really know the Oregon, the plant palette well. But the over eight generation, they are able to test it. And the last thing, the most important thing is that they educated, actually they prepared the, the gardeners very well. The longest serving the, uh, Japanese actually uh, gardeners in Portland Japanese garden. Uh, he just retired a couple of years ago as Michael Kondo served 40 years. So 40 years meaning he basically worked with uh, five garden directors. So um, the, the garden director coming from Japan consecutively was able to basically train the gardeners locally. So that has a big um, last long, in, long impact on how we are able to actually maintain uh, Portland Japanese garden to date. So um, starting from Port Professor Tono in 1963 and then went through eight generation of garden directors and, and the first garden creators. Basically the um, the name change from the garden director to the garden creator is at the end of the eighth uh, garden director, the garden completed. Um, beyond this is a really the uh, maintenance to basically keep the garden hopefully for hundreds of years. And so the garden um, director's job is to basically design and build and then garden creator's primary job is to maintain the vision and of course, physical structure of the garden. So there is a fundamental shift of the responsibility. So I served from 2008 to 2020 until just last year. 
So now um, we have a second generation garden curator, uh, Hugo Tori, and it's just uh, assumed um, the garden curator position at the beginning of this year. So the vision uh, and continue. So currently what I'm doing is uh, uh, my important part of my job now as a chief creator is basically leaving the garden's vision, each garden's in a little more visible way in writing to provide the uh, Hugo to continue going. So this is the last slide, but the journey is to continue those who are interested in so cultural crossing isn't the last uh, basically change. <laughs> and the journey continues. And uh, if you look at the, our website, there is a, um, the current newsletters. And there is a, uh, some discussion about what we call Japan Institute. So I just leave that name with you and for you to explore. Um, the information is available on our website. And thank you again. Uh, coming with me for this journey. Thank you, Sava and Ken, for participating in today's webinar.